On the day of the March equinox, you look up at noon and notice the sun is directly overhead. This means you're standing on the equator. But what if the sun is 52 degrees south relative to your position? Then you're 52 degrees north of the equator. Why? Because geometry. Of course, it's not that simple all year round. Since the Earth's axis is tilted 23 degrees, the sun's apparent position at noon changes throughout the year. By the time of the June solstice, the sun is directly overhead at 23 degrees north. So you know you're 52 degrees north if the sun is 29 degrees south of your position. As you can see, determining latitude is easy. You don't even need elaborate tools to do it. Sure, it helps to have a clock to know when it's noon, but you could just as easily put a stick in the ground and see when the shadow is shortest. Sure, it helps to have a sextant to measure the sun's angle, but you could just as easily measure the length of the stick and its shadows and do the maths. And sure, a calendar also helps, but you don't need to be a genius to count the passing days. Of course, you do need to know which hemisphere you're in, but come on, no one's ever that lost. But while latitude is forthcoming, there is no easy way to determine longitude. For over a millennium, the best anyone could do was choose a fixed reference point, keep track of latitude during journey, measure distance travelled, and using the best available estimate of Earth's circumference, calculate longitude relative to the reference point. This was good enough until extensive overseas exploration became all the rage. Turns out that calculating longitude at sea is both much harder and much more essential. This is the story of the longitude problem. So, the earliest ocean navigators relied on dead reckoning, wherein longitude was determined using estimates of the ship's speed and direction. This method was highly inaccurate on long voyages out of sight of land, but Muslim scholar Al-Biruni supported the idea of the Earth completing a full 360-degree rotation every day, meaning 15 degrees every hour. Imagine you knew the current time of a fixed location. Let's call this reference time. Measuring your local time is straightforward. Thus, you can easily calculate your longitude relative to the fixed location. So really, you just need to somehow determine the reference time. In the early 16th century, Werner proposed measuring the position of the moon relative to the background stars. A century later, Galileo proposed using the orbital periods of Jupiter's four brighter satellites as a universal clock. Later still, Halley proposed using lunar occultations and appulses. All of these methods were time-consuming and all of them were difficult to perform at sea. But surely the solution is obvious, right? Just use a clock to keep track of the reference time. Unfortunately, pre-battery clocks weren't very accurate. The best timekeepers available were pendulum clocks, and those didn't work well at sea. Then, in 1707, disaster struck, and over 1,500 people died because navigators couldn't determine their longitude accurately. So the British Parliament established a system of rewards that would make a very wealthy man out of whomever solved the longitude problem first. All proposed solutions were to be assessed by the official board of longitude. The race was on. So, naturally, they were quickly bombarded with improbable new ideas. One frequently suggested concept was that of the marine chair, a stable viewing platform for observing the moon and stars. Many designs have been submitted, none of which actually worked. Another idea was that of a marine myelometer that would measure distance travelled in water, somehow ignoring ocean currents. There was some talk of special glasses that would make the stars visible during daytime, or the ship could have a dog on board that would be magically injured daily by someone back home, causing it to yelp at noon reference time, or maybe just set fire to London so you can see it from afar. Whatever works. In the end, the best solution came from carpenter and clockmaker John Harrison, who spent a lifetime perfecting his marine chronometer, a timepiece that would remain sufficiently accurate at sea. In the following century, it became common practice for ships to adjust their chronometers when in harbour. To facilitate this, major ports adopted time balls to be dropped every day at precisely 1pm. The usage of time balls became widespread throughout the world, and thus the longitude problem, the greatest scientific challenge of its time, was finally solved. The Longitude Prize was not the first inducement reward in history. It wasn't even the first one offered to solve the longitude problem, but it was unprecedentedly large, which is why it was so successful. Thus, in 2014, the Longitude Committee has reconvened to launch a new prize, this time focused on the greatest scientific challenge of our time, the rise of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. With a reward of £10 million, let us hope the Longitude Prize will make history once again.